some of you might be wondering why are we having a, a conversation uh, can you, everyone hear me okay I'm gonna try not to use the mic why, why are we having a conversation in the kitchen Remember back when we were all little and, and your mom and dad or your grandparents or someone in your family, there was always a conversation in the kitchen and, and you wake up in the morning, there would be coffee brewing, there'd be conversation going on. You want to know what was going on. It was in the kitchen. The kitchen is where the nourishment of your, your, your food came from. The kitchen is the place where the family gather in the morning with their orders of going to school or going to work to start their day. And so we decided that our conversations need to also belong in the kitchen because we need to be real in the kitchen. And so thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for taking the time out of your day uh, to join us to hear these wonderful conversations. Just to give you some context of what the rising class is, when we talk about, some of you know a little bit about Boston Rising, and I'm not going to go into detail, um, but one of the, the, the core components, and I'm going to do a little reading to describe it, that we talk about in the rising class in Boston Rising is that there is a rising class. And what is the rising class? The rising class is an entire community of self-determined people gathered together in community to pursue the American dream. So all of us in here are members of the rising class. Now some of us are on different legs of that journey. Some of us are beginning that journey. And some of us are experiencing some extreme poverty. And they are a further or a different stage of that journey. But all of us are tied together with this one belief that with a community, with each other, and with the help of a solid job, with the help of our mentors, and with the help of an education that we can continue on that journey and that we need each other to be successful in that journey. Uh, it, sometimes it's a story of luck. Sometimes it's a story of being at the right place at the right time. Sometimes it's a story of working hard and working your tail off and someone saying that, hey, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Sometimes we find those opportunities in our neighborhoods, in our churches, our, more, our mosques, our synagogues, on the street. Uh, and sometimes it's here at gatherings where you're sitting in somebody's kitchen eating cookies, drinking coffee, maybe snacking where you'll find that opportunity. So thank you for joining us in the community that starts today. Uh, thank you for being here. And thank you for uh, having your ears open and being, being willing to hear about what, what we're talking about and, and beginning this journey with us. Uh, the speakers we have today really, really don't need any introduction, but I'm going to read a small, small introduction for them both. Uh, I, I feel fortunate that, that, I, um, that one of my opportunities is that I get to be in an organization and have access uh, to folks who, who've been icons to me for years and, and, and have an opportunity to be mentored by, by these great men. Um, I think we all stand on the shoulders of the giants before, uh, before us and some of us need uh, a ladder to climb up uh, so we even get on those shoulders and so I'm still climbing up that ladder so I can stand on the shoulders of the giants before me and, and I'll read a short bio uh, as an introduction. Uh, Mel King has been active through the landscape of neighborhoods, and, and all of us know uh, Mr. King's work. Uh, but you probably didn't know it's been roughly 55 years since he's been doing the work. Uh, while being an educator, a youth worker, a social activist, a community organizer, a developer, a politician, an author, a professor at MIT, he's been responsible for many of the changes that we are fortunate and, and are blessed to experience today. He is responsible for creating the programs at institutions across Boston. He's been a founder of many institutions I, I can't even begin to name. Uh, and most recently, he's been the founder of the South End Technology Center, which many of us have, have, have an opportunity to learn about technology. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to visit it, uh, I, I ask you and, and invite you to take some time to, to try to make that happen. Uh, Mr. King has a bachelor's degree from Chaplin College and a master's degree from my alma mater. And some of us in there, although it's transitions its name, from Boston State College. Please put your hands together for Mel King. Uh, our, our next panelist, uh, Hubert Jones, better known as Hubie, to some of us who've had an opportunity to, 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 to call him Hubie and get to know him better, has been a part of our social landscape for almost 45 years. So that, that would make you the, the, the younger uh, of, of two Hubie. Um, Mr. Jones has played a leadership role in the formation and building of so many organizations and at least 30 um, at last count of organizations that Mr. Jones has, have, has been responsible for founding, been on the founding team or creating um, as, as um, a sole um, founder of these organizations. Uh, Mr. Jones has been honored numerous times for his dedication um, for children's advocacy and he was ultimately um, one of the things that, that you might remember was honored in a way that there was a fund, um, the Hubie Fund, which was started uh, at Boston Foundation. Uh, Mr. Jones earned his bachelor's degree at uh, the City College of New York 
and a master's degree from social work at Boston University. Or there's a couple of Boston University alum, two, two Boston University alum, School of Social Work. All right. Uh, and Mr. Jones have, has been honored numerous times with doctor's degrees from Northeastern, the University of Maryland, Leslie College, and the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology. Um, most recently, uh, Mr. Jones's last endeavor, uh, or most recent endeavor, is Higher Ground, which is a place-based initiative uh, located in Roxbury, uh, in between Grove Hall and Dudley. Please put your hands together for uh, Mr. Peter Jones. Oh, uh, and, and Boston Children's <laughs> Choir, of course. Uh, of course. <laughs> Sorry. Definitely. And you, you know, and we, you got to bring out the music in you. you got to bring <laughs> out the music. <laughs> so, so these conversations are, are like I said, are, are kitchen conversations. So it's not uh, necessarily about um, an interview, or it's not a, a panel discussion. And we want you to scoot in and get close if, if you can't hear us. Uh, but we're we're having a conversation around a kitchen table. So if, if you're not close, imagine a virtual kitchen table. Um, again, our, our journey of rising doesn't happen alone, and so the, I'm going to start with questions, and if you feel compelled to jump in and ask questions as well, uh, when you feel lulls in the conversation, jump in and ask questions, because we're all family at the same table here. So I'll, I'll kick us off and ask the first question. We all face uh, pivotal moments in our lives um, when we think about our stories about rising. Can you think about uh, one or two stories, um, one or two pivotal moments um, in your in your journey to get here, in your journey to rise, uh, that had the, one of the biggest impacts um, in the way that you you shape your it has shaped your thinking today. Well, at 11 years of age, uh, a young man in my neighborhood in the South Bronx, uh, who was 15 years of age, was cornered one night after a party by by the Slicksters. The Slicksters were the neighborhood gang. And he was stabbed to death. Uh, my mother and his mother were very close friends. My older sister and his sister were, went, to, went to high school and college together. And it really shook the neighborhood. Uh, for some reason, my mother took me to the wake at age 11. And I sat there looking at this handsome 15 year old in a coffin, trying to make sense out of a senseless act. And it shook me. And the tragedy of Billy Knight haunts me to this day. Uh, and it clearly made it clear to me that I had to figure a way through the mean streets of the South Bronx uh, to have a path to get to where I could rise, where I could uh, be educated, where I could really be a part of the community without being so frightened by what was going on in terms of gangs, drugs, etc. Uh, so that was a, that was a an, an experience that has uh, has, has remained with me. Uh, the second thing I would mention is that when I was about 15 years old, 16 years old, the Bronx Home News plastered across the front page a picture of my apartment building. And in front of the apartment building were piles of garbage cans with garbage spilling out. The Bronx Home News was on a, a, a campaign to deal with the fact that city services in terms of garbage collection was not happening as it should uh, in the South Bronx. And they used this picture and across the picture at the top, the caption was the dirtiest house in the Bronx. My older sisters who were dating and all the rest were devastated. <laughs> Who's going to be dealing with us? We're living in the dirtiest house in the Bronx. <laughs> now God knows it was, we had, our tr we had our challenges, you know, with mice and roaches and bed bugs and an absentee landlord who didn't do what he was supposed to do. 
and we never thought about it as being the, the dirtiest house in the Bronx or a hovel. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it was a stigmatizing event. Uh, and uh, I guess it, it fed something down deep is like, oh, some way I'm going to find my way out of the South Bronx. Some way I'm going to find my way out of the South Bronx and, and out, of this kind of, out of this kind of situation. So those are two, event, two events uh, that I think have played a role in shaping my my resolve uh, to make a difference, uh, to help play a role in, in building institutions and organizations and communities, and to make sure that young people particularly uh, live in communities and environments uh, where, they can, where they can thrive. Uh, and uh, it also fueled my anger uh, about uh, conditions that should not exist and my commitment to make sure that I could do anything I could over time to, uh, to play a role in change. All yours, Mel. Mm -hmm. I graduated from Boston Technical High School and have been interested in going to one of the colleges in the South, <clears throat> uh, Morehouse. Um, cost, I think, 220 bucks, which would have been the family income for months, two months, whatever it was. My father had passed when I was um, 13. And so then I thought I would try to go to Northeastern. And so I went over to Northeastern. They said they had scholarships. And <clears throat> I was told that because I didn't have a language, I couldn't get in the school. Or that was it. I, okay, uh, so I'd get a job. Turned out one of my friends was given a uh, football scholarship to uh, Clapham College, Orangeburg, South Carolina. And <clears throat> told the coach that they should talk to me and a few other folks from Boston. And um, my older brother, who was in the military at the time, told my mother that my mouth was too big to go to school in the South. And that, um, so I didn't go that year. The next year, the coach came up and uh, sat in my mother's kitchen and convinced her that he would make sure that I would be okay if I went to school in the South. So with another friend, Sylvester Mills, we got on the train at South Station, sat where we wanted. We got to D.C and we had to change to the Jim Crow train. And um, it was like, whoa. Um, and then ended up in South Carolina, Orangeburg, and got into football, whatnot. I think the thing that impacted me most about it was some of the stereotypes, some of the things that they talked about black folks in the South. I found that there were folks who were really working to change
conditions and circumstances. And so between that and the um, discrimination, discrimination, it was changing for me. It was really part of what uh, got me thinking about the kinds of things that I would do. I think the clincher came when I did my practice teaching down there and I went to a small uh, community, Omen, South Carolina, and was teaching eighth, seventh, eighth graders. And they had an outhouse, um, no other kinds of facilities, and I was, you know, you hear about all the differences, etc. And then when you put Mike in it, um, and I, that was the second thing that said to me that I had to do something about the uh, discrimination and the kinds of uh, uh, things that impacted uh, uh, folks. I would say that the other thing that impacted me was being in the presence of Paul Robeson. Um, right there at Dudley Station, there was a hall, Liberty Hall, and on a scorching hot uh, July night, went to hear him speak. And I had known about him because he was all American football player, he was a lawyer, he sang, he did everything. And he was like, uh, you want to talk about somebody having a model, an uh, idol, uh, it was it. And I sat there, listened to him talk about the importance of the working class and bringing people together across the, the world. And I was just so um, caught up with the way that he spoke. And then at the end, he sang, okay? And so if you... Um, ever get a chance, get one of his CDs or DVDs, no, LPs, um, and listen to it, then you understand a piece of what um, kind of impact he could have on you. And so the question of organizing and working to bring cross-sections of folks together, um, in part came out of my neighborhood growing up, but also got reinforced by um, being involved in that moment uh, with him. Now, there's a third piece. One of the things that happened growing up, my folks didn't like us going to the movies. So up until 13, 14, um, the only movies we went to were at the church, where they had the um, travelogues and things where you could see people in other countries. And <clears throat> so we did get a chance to go. Um, it was Tarzan and the Apes, and then it was black people turning white on the screen, being the butt of jokes. And the next day in school, you know, you'd know that some of the white youngsters saw that and they'd come out and they'd make derogatory comments about you, etc. So I stopped going to the movies. Uh, I think I did see um, one uh, which Lena Horn was in. Um, <clears throat> I got down to college, and <clears throat> in Orangeburg, there was a theater run by black people uh, where we had films that portrayed black life in positive ways. I even learned that the original cowboys were black, okay, because We've been given Tom Mix, Lone Ranger, and that kind of kind of thing, and that had an incredible impact on me because it signaled who was in charge of the venue could chuck show what they wanted on their menu, and that is one of the things that has stuck with me in terms of uh, work uh, ever since. 
Thank you. You know, we just he hearing your hearing your stories, I, I I think in the in the media recently, you know, we, we especially during um, an election season, we, we've been hearing a lot about um, the rugged individual American, um, about um, self-made men pulling themselves up by the straps, no help. If you can't do it that way, there's no way to, to do it. And, and we all know the truth is that we, did, we didn't just pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and we weren't self-made just because we just walked out of the room and turned ourselves in a million, to a millionaire in, in, in 10 years or so. Uh, when, when you think about, and we mentioned Paul Robeson as, as one of those influential figures, and when we think about who were the folks, who were our mentors, who were your mentors, uh, who were the people around you um, that helped shape that story for you? Who were the, 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 the folks that, we, that, that you did it with? And, and, and what can we learn um, from that experience uh, in the 21st century when we're being inundated by this? If you can't make it alone, you really can't do it. Well, I have uh, five sisters, three older and two younger. <coughs> My oldest sisters basically were the path makers. They were my models. Uh, they were academically gifted. My oldest sister, who just turned 89, uh, went to Hunter College High School, uh, the elite high school in New York. So she was, she, she was very talented academically. And she was, uh, she, she was a model. And they, at least my three older sisters showed me a path through being able to be educated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was, uh, that was extraordinarily important uh, to me to have uh, siblings above me who were terrific models and who also cared for me, protected me in, in, in many ways. Uh, my father was probably the smartest human being I have ever known in terms of raw intelligence. He was just absolutely brilliant. I don't know, he, he could knock off a New York Times crossword puzzle like this, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, he, uh, he had graduated valedictorian uh, from uh, Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. Uh, wanted to become a doctor. Uh, and he got involved with the Pullman Company. During his college years, uh, during the summer, he substituted for a Pullman quarters, quarters on uh, on vacation, and that got him in, I would, I would say, ensnared with the Pullman Company. Uh, Pullman Porters were, had, had one of the best jobs for black men, you know, back in 1915, etc. Uh, and uh, he got married, and, and so his ambitions to be a, a doctor got derailed. Uh, but he was extraordinarily smart and spent a lot of time working with his union, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, uh, under A. Philip Randolph. And so I would hear about A. Philip Randolph all the time. The chief says, the chief says. In fact, A. Philip Randolph gave the eulogy at my father's funeral. Uh, and one of the highlights for me was my father taking me to meet A. Philip Randolph on 125th Street, where the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters uh, had, their, had their offices. But one of the things I knew uh, as I moved on in my journey is that uh, I have had opportunities that my father would have died for. And uh, I, use, I probably get overcommitted, my wife says I do, I probably get overcommitted because I always have to evaluate when people offer me opportunities to do things that are important. Uh, how can I turn this away? My father would have died for this opportunity uh, to use their intelligence, make a difference, have social capital, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I would say that uh, I don't want to get psychoanalytic here, but I would say that my drive uh, has been somewhat connected with the fact that I felt uh, that my father, who was brilliant, 
uh, never had an opportunity to fully use his intelligence. Now, he, did, he found other ways to use his intelligence. He was basically a legal advocate uh, who took the cases for uh, porters who were charged with doing the wrong thing on the road, and they had to go before, before, before management for disciplinary reasons. And he, he represented them. In fact, his briefs were so incredible, downtown lawyers in New York couldn't believe that a non-lawyer had written these briefs, okay? Uh, so that was one way in which he was able to, uh, able to use his, his talent. But I think the crusher for me was uh, pretty late along, he wanted to become one of the officers uh, in the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And a prominent person was retiring, and he thought he had a shot uh, at getting that job. But uh, he didn't. And he really didn't realize that he really didn't have a shot because he had not been there when Randolph and the, and the, and, and the guys who had to take tremendous risk formed the union, who had been through the fire of forming the Brothers of Sleeping Car Porters. He had not been a part of that whole thing. So somebody who was less talented, half as smart, who had been there at that time, got this position. Uh, I know my father was crushed. I know I was crushed for him. Not much was said about it, but uh, that, that has played a role in shaping, I think, uh, a lot of what's happened to me in my, in my adult years and, and, uh, and so forth. So, anyway. It's interesting to hear you talk about the um, the railroad. Um, I used to work on the New York New Haven uh, railroad um, as a fourth cook. And I say fourth cook because most folks don't know that's the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> This impact that it had, because many of the cooks and waiters were college graduates, and you know, sometimes they'd come up and say, "Four C, um, what are you going to do? You're going back to college." I was a, I guess, sophomore. And said, you know, just someone would say, "Don't waste your time." So and so has this degree, he has this degree, and they ain't going to give you a job. So you better stick with the railroad so you can have um, have this job. And at this, two things: one, it increased my resolve um, because at the same time. Um, because the war had just ended, some of the guys that were in the war who came back to the neighborhood were also unable to get jobs. And uh, so they also were kind of a pull on, on why I would go back to college and whatnot. They're not going to give you uh, a job. I didn't listen to them obviously, went, finished uh, school, and um, thought that one of the things that would be important to do would be to work with youth around uh, their thinking about their future, but mostly started off working with youth who were on street corners, because we did have uh, gangs at that time, and one of the programs that got established was the street corner of detached workers, which I became became one. Let me back up because the neighborhood I grew up in, called the New York Streets, when they should have been named the Indian Nation Streets. I lived on Seneca. Next street was uh, Oneida, Oswego. Genesee, 
uh, all of those uh, Indian nation, uh, Indian tribes. But in any event, um, there were 32 different racial, ethnic, cultural groups in the neighborhood. And so the school that we went to, they called the Little League of Nations. <coughs> when my children went there, they called it the Little United Nations. The important aspect of this is that I learned quite a bit about uh, the different groups um, and their communities. We ate, hung out, and did things together <coughs> so that um, I grew up in a climate where, like it says in um, a Revelation, where all the tribes were welcome and all the gifts were shared. We shared their different foods, um, the person across the street made wine, they sent it over to the family, and all that kind of environment. And one thing that was significant was that there was a kind of modeling of how people work together in a community. Uh, for example, those are guys, when it snowed, uh, if they wanted to play two-hand tag or stick ball, squash, they would get out shovels, drums, you know, clean the street right down, put the snow in the sewer, et cetera. <coughs> and so we just grew up under those kind of kind of circumstances where people, you know, I have a friend who said that now people complain about the dirt when they have the broom in their hands. Well, these guys never complained about the dirt. They just took that room or the shovel and you know one of the things then we had uh, horses and the horse manure was always on the street or something and so they cleaned it up got buckets washed it down you're so, not that old come on uh, <laughs> ask your sister <laughs> um, so <laughs> that, that um, um, kind of environment, and Hubie talked about uh, his sisters. Um, well, we had, um, my uh, aunt had come from Barbados and sent for my father and mother, and they came up and settled in the South End. And then another uh, of her brothers came up and then a, a sister. And so there was this extended family in, in the neighborhood. And um, my, um, as I said, father died young. But prior to that, my cousins who were older than all the rest of us, all women, spent so much time in the house that they called my mother auntie and my father uncle. And we grew up calling them auntie and uncle. It wasn't until we were 11, 12, 13 we realized that we could be calling them mom and dad, but we called them that. But the significant aspect of it, when you talked about how they kid, their sisters. Um, these were the most, there were three of them, uh, well, five all together, but three of them who really hung out at the house. When they, they were the most politically astute persons that um, I knew. And um, they were no nonsense about anybody taking advantage of them or their cousins. And so I grew up in that kind of environment where um, these um, older uh, cousins really set a framework for how you're supposed to look out for each other and no, not take any nonsense from anybody about you know, who you are and what you should expect for your, yourself. 
if you went into a store and the clerk or somebody looked at you in a way that they would let the clerk know about that kind of behavior. Um, when you talked about the union stuff, uh, my father was the secretary for the uh, Longshoremen Union, a segregated union that had um, he worked on the sugar boats. So he was the secretary for that, and he talked a lot about how they had to work, organize, in order to get the pay, get the seniority, all the things that were important. And I learned about the CIO, I learned about <coughs> when they organized, went to Washington, and they got the, um, essentially the Social Security and the unemployment uh, kinds, of, uh, kinds of benefits. So I got really schooled uh, on that, and I'm going to repeat, if you were around, you would not mess with my cousins, okay? <laughs> you would not have. This isn't Thanksgiving and there's no little table and this is the first time we're doing this. Um, I, I, I want to open it up and before, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation with all the, the with all the question asking. You know, is, is there any any thoughts, reflections uh, that, that someone someone who's sitting not so close to the table is thinking that they feel like they want, they feel compelled to ask right now? You know, I find this conversation fascinating from a lot of different points of views, from the fire carter, New England blacks, and philanthropy. And listening to, to the men I love, my mentors, I talk to them all the time, or talk to them all the time. It makes me think of my own life in growing up in Cleveland, part of it in suburban Cleveland, part of it in the Glenville area. And what it makes me think about is how we see people and see their potential. Growing up in Cleveland, we would go to Glenville Seventh-day Adventist Church, take people home, go to the house eat, walk with their kids, go through the store, come back to our own home, so forth and so on, and you have this wonderful childhood life. Only when I moved away you know, to New York, lived there for a few years, kind of only stayed on my side of town, then I go back to the community and I realize, oh my God, I've been walking through the ghetto. Oh my God, I've been talking to people that supposedly were poor. I've been talking and walking and listening and mentored by people that have been thrown away, told that they're undeserved, under-resourced the whole time. How do we get away from that? I really want to know how do we work to really end poverty as we, how do we have a new vision? Not the new vision of just those poor people, but how we have resources in our community. We've had resources in our past. We have resources today. How do we stop where we are today and really envision a new place and bring that same sort of energy to that visioning like people did for hip hop, to even create a hip hop generation. How do we create this end of poverty generation that maybe we don't do this work in 15 or 20 years? <laughs> Tempted to say that if I knew, we wouldn't be here. Um, I. I think it's in stories. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons why uh, when we started the fellows program mm -hmm. at MIT, I wanted to focus on uh, media. And so some of the folks who came in earlier were people who worked on uh, cable TV. and. Um, for me, when I talked about going to college in the South and seeing film that had a positive portrayal, that whole image building, and you described some of the ways that people um, viewed. Um, well, sometimes you have to deal with the fact that, I say sometimes all the time, that there's an internalization. Mm -hmm. And so that the work has to be one of breaking that down and putting the ability to tell the stories positively about who people are um, 
in as many ways as possible. And I keep telling folks when we talk about uh, advertising or the importance of repetition is that um, you would think that by now everybody knew that Coke was the real thing, Coca-Cola, all right? Um, <laughs> but think about it, they continue to advertise. Right? And we need to continue to get the stories out, the positive stories, the things that people have done, the acts of kindness that happen in communities, the relationships. We talk about real, when I talked about the community I grew up in, it was one in which uh, all the tribes were welcome where people shared and cared and told the stories about that. So I believe very, very firmly in the role of the media in um, shaping the um, perceptions and misperceptions that that we we have. So, I mean, there are other aspects of this, uh, unquestionably, but for me, one of the crucial ones has to do with that. So, when we came back, I talked about the fact that the uh, fellows got involved in the uh, cable, and so with Oscar Jackson and a few of the folks that come from Washington, they. Cable vision was coming into Boston. You now you know you have BNN and you have some of the um, Somerville has something, Cambridge, Boston, and many of the neighborhoods was because the political process that we went through with folks like Tom Atkins and some of the other counselors was cable can't come in unless they put the power to show what goes on in the neighborhoods into the hands of the people that are, that are there. Um, but that came out of, for me, the experience based on my folks saying, you can't watch that bad stuff, seeing what was positive there, and knowing that if we could do something similar around that, and we even to the extent that at the community center, uh, making sure that books and things, because you remember it was Dick and Jane and whatnot, um, I think our efforts change some of that so that there are more inclusive stories. But we have to tell stories. We have to get the um, people and youth to see um, what's, what's positive. I want to tell one little piece because this, for me, um, we had uh, a person, Archie Williams, since deceased, um, um, open up a supermarket, uh, Freedom Foods, and if you remember that, was over on uh, Columbia Road. And I was running the Urban League at the time, and lived in the South End, and Joyce and I would get in the car and we'd go up to Freedom Foods to purchase. And so one day at the Urban League, I asked folks if they had uh, gone to buy food Freedom Foods. And the response was, well, it's more expensive over there. And I said, well, let's check. So we went and got a list of the foods that are pretty common in the black community. And we went to uh, First National um, Stop and Shop, and there was a name before Shaw's um, Star Market. Uh, anyhow, we went and we checked them out. And then I said, let's go up to um, Freedom Foods. And in all the basics, Freedom Foods was much cheaper, okay? But they had bought into the fact that uh, we don't do as well. Our stuff is not as good. And so these are folks who are working to try and organize folks of color. We had a program called community development through community control, okay? But the big place for controlling was in people's, people's minds. So for me, it's a combination of stories and getting people really to uh, deal with facts and not with fiction. Well, uh, ending poverty, I mean, you can deal with it on all kinds of levels. You can deal with it on the macro level. 
I mean, let's face it, we have poverty in America because of structural inequality. We're having policies, uh, we're, we're, we're in a policy move now at the congressional level that would, uh, you know, make this, in a, this, this structural inequality even deeper in terms of safety nets, access to money to go to school, you know, all the things we know. So there's a, that's a, there's a whole policy discussion around what needs to be done to make sure that we have the, uh, the policies that, that, that deal with the structural inequality. But on the basic human level, I'll, I'll just say this. Uh, and this is one of the things about Boston that troubles me. And I'm a part of the problem because I bought into it. We don't, we're, 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 we're pretty much isolated from each other. Uh, you know, I've known Bell King for I don't know how many years I've known him. I've known Bell King since 1963 and his wife Joyce. We've been, we've been to the barricades on, on, on many things. And I love her and him and I love his wife and, and my wife and all the rest. I think Mel King's been in my house twice at most. Okay? Uh, and that's true for many people I have worked with for many years on lots of things. Now that's nuts, right? Uh, we just don't, uh, we don't connect with each other uh, at a you know, deep social way. Uh, and it's part of the culture, and it's part of the culture of this town, okay? Uh, and because we don't, we don't have the discussions with each other about all of the things that trouble us, all of the things that we should be addressing. I mean, I, I won't go, I, there's no party I go to uh, with black professionals where before the evening is over, somebody will, will, will talk about how troubled they are about what's not happening for our kids, okay? Deeply troubled. Uh, and I said, well, what are you going to do about it? I mean, who are you going to connect with that you can you know, do something to turn that sort of thing around? Uh, so we, you know, I, you know, people come into this town uh, to do very important work. We, know, we have a new president who's come into Emerson, okay? We have a, there are two or three of these, okay? Uh, and I've been trying to talk to people, are we, going, are we going to hold an event to welcome this person to Boston? To, 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 tell, it, to tell Lee Pelton, you know, where the minefields are? Uh, what, da 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 And people say, yeah, we'll get to that, you know. Blah, blah. Hasn't happened yet, okay? Yeah. It hasn't happened yet, okay? Uh, so is this kind of disconnection that we are responsible for, me included, okay, that uh, have to be dealt with. Uh, all the things that I've done and Mel has done, you've heard about all the things we've done, all of that basically came out of people who sat together and had some concerns about something and were willing to stay in a room long enough to, 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 to talk it through, work it through, and decide to do something about it, okay? That's how it starts. Uh, that's why I'm very happy. Uh, I mean, that I, I, I got to Boston instead of going back to my, my, my native New York. Because in Boston, you have a chance. It doesn't take much if people come together, talk about their concerns, willing to stay at it for a while, to figure out how to move and to get something done. I don't think I could have been half as successful in New York because it's just too too large, too big, too da 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 da. I don't think, okay? But Boston is a village. But Boston is a village, even though it's one of the you know fifth or sixth largest cities in the in the country, largest media market, and all the rest. But we have a, an opportunity here. To uh, there are all these very smart, smart folks, 
to come together and try to talk about this stuff and think this stuff through. But you've got to keep at it and you've got to keep talking until at some point something happens. And some of you are hearing about higher ground, you know better than anybody else here because you were there at the beginning. We talked for two years. We had to talk for two years. And, and then the talking got endless. <laughs> But we needed to do it. We needed to really think through what is it we're trying to do? What kind of service model can we develop that might get decent results for, for young people that we're not now getting? Okay? Okay? Now I, I knew from the, the get go it was going to take two years of conversation. All right? And I had the ability to hold most of the people in the conversation long enough that we could decide if we had a model worth something that we should form an organization around and raise money around and, and get it off the, get it off the ground. So uh, if we're gonna go on a, if we're gonna go to a new place, we have got to have the commitment and the I call it revolutionary patience to talk about this stuff for a long time. That doesn't mean never do anything. So that you understand what you're talking about, where people are coming from, what you really, what's really important to you, what's really important to the people, and the people who are the, the beneficiaries of all of this have to be in the process. So it's not this top-down nonsense. Uh, for me, that's that. For me, that's the challenge. I can sit here and talk about macro policy. I can sit here and talk about that, 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 and return ending poverty. But if we want, we want to have a chance at a new vision a new thing, a new way of working. Hey, uh, it wouldn't take much to put Boston on fire. Okay, really. It wouldn't take much to put Boston on fire. Okay? Now some of you know I work at City here, right? And I, I love it, I think they've done a lot of stuff. And people I've mentioned there, I say, if, I, if you gave me 140 young people for a year to go out of this community, I'd have Boston on fire. Okay, I'd have, I'd have Boston on fire. Now that doesn't mean you're not doing good stuff. And I, okay. Uh, so I don't think I think that's I think that's I think that's the real challenge. Can we can we come together? I've been into too many false starts uh, on, on, on projects and you know, it, you know it goes for three months and then everybody starts to dribble away uh, we, we've got to uh, we, we've got to come together we've got to we've got to break these patterns of social isolation and uh, and not getting into a space where we can really know each other really know each other really know each other. That's what was great about the Community Fellows Program. Mel King had me in the first class, right? Right? And I said- Nobody that, ever has you in a class, so don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was there, the, at the first two or three months, I was blown away. I had no idea. I, I had done stuff with, with, with Chuck Turner, da da da. I had no idea of Chuck Turner as a spiritual human being. And no clue. Deeply spiritual human being. I had no clue. Okay? Uh, and I was like, whoa, really? I mean, you know, we probed it, we dealt it. Uh, real. Okay? Uh, I had no clue about a lot of stuff about Byron Russia. He ended up running my campaign for the United States Congress. Okay, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, he, but, but the Community Fellows Program and Mel King, with his vision, offered us an opportunity to know each other, deeply know each other, so we could uh, decide whether we wanted to commit, our, commit ourselves to each other and to the work that was important to do. I don't talk it too long. Well, we, 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 we enjoy listening. I'm, I'm getting the, the, the evil eye on the corner, so I, but I, I, I want to leave us with one final thought and question, uh, and, and, and maybe if there's a, a, a quick uh, one-minute answer to this question, uh, if possible. Um, are, are you still rising? Um, and when will you know that you've, you've, uh, you've reached the, the American dream in your vision? Well, I, 
I just turned 78. Uh, my plan is to run until I can go no farther. Okay, number one. Uh, it took me a long time to figure it all out. But what I learned and I'm continuing to learn is it's about vision, it's about smart strategy, it's about creative tactics, and it's about staying there for the long haul. Okay? I've waited out a lot of adversaries in this time. Okay? Okay? And I knew over time they'd be gone. And I'd have the space to do the things I wanted to do. Yeah, but there were other people who wanted to do it. I mean, who wanted to embrace it. So for me, uh, it took me some time to figure out it. That, and that's what I continue to look to learn about. Vision, strategy, tactics, and staying there for the long. Last night I spoke at a leadership group um, down at the um, SEIU office and one of the things that happened is that uh, Judy Meredith moderating asked different people who were in the room why they came and the best moment for me was when the youth from a city school talked about they were working on developing the new leaders. You know, they were 15, 16, 17 year olds talking about developing the new, new leaders. And I was really, really tickled because I think sometimes we um, use that and we all say that the youth are the future. And I know that everything we do right now in this room has an impact on everybody's future, and not just the youth. So I've tried to get people to understand that that's something that we really need to, to deal with. So what we do right now has its impact um, from now on, and that um, we don't want to cast aside the possibilities of anyone in terms of what role that it can play or they can play in building the um, building the future. Um, I think the issue of um, our imagination is crucial. Um, in the book Beloved, um, Morrison says to the people, the grace you can have is the grace you can imagine. If you can't see it, you won't have it. I think our issues are all solvable. The big issue is, can we imagine? And if we can, we will do what it takes to get there. And we spend a lot of time dealing, unfortunately, in the arenas where people don't imagine that change is possible. And so we're not advocating our belief in what we think can be the way we spend the time dealing with the folks like we spent for the last whatever days now on this three strike stuff. Okay? Um, and I wish you could have heard the woman who spoke about uh, her life and where she would have where she would have been if this kind of um, law was in force when 
she did her third thing. And if you could have just seen, listen to the what happens when somebody does have a chance and they do change. I think part of our issues deal with um, this whole notion of change. And when I listen to people and they act like they don't believe change is possible, I said, well, it's because you don't want to change. I said, so you ought to own that and not get into the other. I think that if we, uh, I like what uh, Vincent Harding says in his book, There is a River, um, that the river is a metaphor for the for kind of change. And he says that, you know, what we're looking for is a new and informed humanity, not equal opportunity in a dehumanized society. And part of what we've been dealing with is you know, a dehumanizing society and trying to relate in that way. And what our opportunity is, what I believe possible is that we can have a new and informed humanity.